Okay, we're ready to uh, discuss and really summarize what you've learned about uh, a Christian worldview of rhetoric and examine that together. So uh, that's the purpose of this lecture in particular. We've taken time to examine the question carefully and consider it really from all sides. You've looked at um, rhetoric. We've traced the history of it. Um, not the theological history because we shouldn't act as if creation is somehow theological and not historical or prehistoric. There is no prehistory in the history of the world. The only prehistory is um, God in eternity and we found rhetoric there as well. So uh, we began in the beginning. We went back to the beginning and traced rhetoric um, through its use, through its development as a subject, um, as a formal course of study, and so on. Then we went back and we looked at objections. We looked at the way that um, Socrates, in particular, um, objected to the use of rhetoric that was common in his day, and particularly sophistic rhetoric, um, the sophistry of Gorgias and the, uh, his contemporaries, his students, and so on. And what um, Socrates considered to be the imitation of an art, and not a pure art, um, but uh, a form of flattery, as he called it, the ignorant, persuading the ignorant. And, uh, and we've taken some time to talk through those things at this point, and now to examine exactly what a Christian should embrace about rhetoric and what a Christian should reject about rhetoric. So we want today to offer you a conclusion. Is rhetoric a Christian study? Can Christians use it? Um, and a lot of times we approach these things that way, um, where we want to know, well, what's wrong with using it? Um, I think the immature Christian asks, what's wrong with it? And the mature Christian, a maturing Christian, asks, what's right with it? Um, but I think that the right answer, the right question to ask is, what is best? What is best for me to do as a Christian? That's what we want to know. We want to know not just if, if as Christians we can do this. You know, can we watch TV as Christians? Well, yes, we can. Um, but should we? Should we do this? Um, and on what grounds? Uh, how do we defend it as Christians? So I want to offer you a Christian defense of rhetoric uh, in this lecture. Rhetoric is not the invention of pagans. That's the first thing that we need to understand. People will characterize it that way, but when they do, they mischaracterize it. Pagans certainly played a role in codifying, systematizing, developing the formal study of rhetoric, um, organizing it into a science and an art, but they did not give us rhetoric, not at all. In fact, pagans merely observed what makes rhetoric effective and developed a systematic study of it. Um, they, they certainly did that, uh, but it would be false and mistaken for us to think that pagans were the inventors of rhetoric. You might remember that earlier in this course we pointed out, in fact, that it's not necessary to study rhetoric in order to use it, and in fact, in order to use it well. In fact, one of the things we've insisted on is that rhetoric is inescapable. Everyone uses it. Um, you either use it well um, or you use it poorly, but you don't have a choice about whether you'll use it or not, and that's because of what rhetoric is. Essentially, rhetoric is um, the art of communicating clearly and effectively. Uh, communication including written discourse, um, oral discourse, uh, if we can use the big words. Um, your, your written presentations, your oral, oral presentations, um, the written word and the spoken word, uh, both of those. Learning to communicate clearly and effectively using those means. Um, and with that in mind, um, again, everyone who speaks or writes 
is either communicating clearly and effectively or um, clearly ineffectively, um, either way. So some people, you know, are able to sit down with a paintbrush and a canvas and are able, without any training at all, to paint a beautiful picture. Um, but training will take someone who's a naturally gifted artist and make them better. I've seen kids play basketball on the, at the city park and play very well without ever having received any coaching whatsoever. But we also should recognize that good coaching will make them better, will improve them. And the same is true of rhetoric. We all use it. It's impossible not to use it. If you hold your tongue in silence, that's a form of rhetoric. And silence sometimes is a powerful way of speaking. Um, so whether you've ever been trained in rhetoric or not, you're using it. The training increases your ability to use it. Uh, training enhances natural ability. When we learn things, when we learn how to do things the right way, we'll become proficient with it. We know that pagans were not inventors of rhetoric. No man, in fact, invented rhetoric at all. God created us with the gift of speech and the ability, and also, if I could say, the desire to communicate. Rhetoric teaches us to use that gift that God gave us and use it well, uh, to communicate clearly and effectively. God himself did not create rhetoric. There was not a time when God created rhetoric. Do you understand that? The Bible teaches us that in the beginning was the Word. Think about that. In the beginning was the Word. What is the Word referring to? The Greek word that's used in John chapter 1, verse 1 is the word logos. You might recognize that because we talked about Lagos in one of our other lectures where we talked about the three modes of persuasion. Um, the three artistic modes of persuasion are ethos, pathos, and logos, or logos. Um, we get our word logic from the Greek word logos. You'll remember that Socrates preferred dialectic to rhetoric. Dialectic, um, which is logic. It was more than just a preference for him. He rejected rhetoric in favor of logic or dialectic. Aristotle answered Socrates, saying that rhetoric is the counterpart of dialectic, that there are different motions of the same thing. When you speak clearly and effectively, it is evidence that you were thinking clearly and effectively. And in fact, clear, effective thinking is of no value to anyone besides yourself if it is never voiced, never expressed, never spoken. And so Aristotle argued that you can't just go through life thinking clearly. You also think clearly for a purpose so that you can clearly express your thoughts. So dialectic forms the foundation of which rhetoric is the product. And rhetoric... Is, it, it, Dialectic is the springboard for rhetoric. So back to what we were saying. Jesus Christ is the Word. We know in John 1 and verse 1 it is speaking of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Just that the Word in John 1, 1 is the Greek word logos. The word logos means a lot more than just word. It is a rich, deep, and fascinating word. The best definition, and much has been written, in fact, I have these, if you look behind me here, these dictionaries, uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, um, has um, pages written on the Greek word logos, explaining its use, the way it was understood in the Greek world, and so on. So understand, I'm taking a complex word um, and giving it a, a very precise meaning, really a synonym. Um, but one meaning of the word logos that really I think is the best summary of the meaning of that word is the word reason. 
Logos means reason. The Greeks actually considered Logos to be the animating power of the universe. They thought of it as the force that causes everything that exists to exist. That They considered it to be the life force. If, if you pause for a minute and think about what makes a thing to be alive, what what constitutes life? If you, if you think about that for a moment, the Greeks said logos is what constitutes life. It is the stuff that life is made of. It is what animates a being. All right, They thought of it as the force that causes everything that exists. Only they believed that the logos actually caused all of their gods to exist as well. Now, in order to understand that, you would need to understand a few things about the Greek view of God and the way Greeks viewed their gods in particular. Nothing like the way we view our God um, at all. They were basically, essentially, superhuman beings, um, a, a, a step above us. They had um, power, um, supernatural power, um, but they also were... Um, at the beck and call of fate, they were fate controlled them, and so um, and then they believed that logos animated them. It's interesting, though, the way John uses logos. John the apostle was saying something very profound when he boldly proclaimed that in the beginning was the logos, and then when he took it a step further, and said in verse fourteen that the Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, John the Apostle was saying something revolutionary, because John was saying that the animating power of the universe was not just a mere force or power, that it was a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was saying that the Greeks didn't take it far enough that there was a person who created everything, who causes everything, who keeps us alive, who animates us, and so on. Now, my point here is not in order to delve into the depths of John chapter 1. I simply want you to see that the Word has no beginning. Jesus Christ is the Word. What does that mean? What is a word? Well, a word is an expression of a concept or a meaning, a thought. Thoughts are expressed in words. Jesus Christ is the word. How so? Well, he is the infinite expression of the infinite God. Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation of the invisible God. Jesus Christ, not just with his mouth, but with his life, with his being, expressed clearly and effectively who God is, what God is. Jesus Christ declares it. The Bible says that. A variety of different ways. In Hebrews, we're told that he is the express image of his person, um, that he is the image of the invisible God. The Bible um, speaks of that uh, a number of different ways. Jesus himself taught us, if you've seen God, if you've seen me, you've seen God. I and my Father are one, um, and so on. And this, is, this was the point that he was making throughout his life. And it reminds us of rhetoric, because just as Jesus Christ is the Word, the clear and effective expression of all that God is, even so rhetoric uh, is a clear, effective expression, uh, declaration of our thoughts, um, of both abstract and concrete ideas. Um, expressed in rhetoric. The word, Jesus Christ is the word, is rhetoric in its highest form. All we can ever hope to do is to communicate in a way that resembles 
however poorly, however vaguely, resembles the way God has spoken to us. And as Christians, we ought to strive to express clearly and effectively, to write, communicate, speak clearly and effectively. So all that to say, no pagan invented rhetoric. There was not a time when rhetoric was created. Rhetoric is as eternal as Jesus Christ, the Word. We saw earlier that it was the serpent who misused rhetoric. But let me point out to you that it was a misuse of rhetoric. What the serpent did in the garden when the serpent said to, to Eve, Has God surely said, shalt thou surely die, and so on. I know I'm misquoting that. But what he was saying to, um, to Eve was not, was not rhetoric, because rhetoric is used um, to proclaim the truth. The serpent misused it, abused rhetoric, in order to convince Eve to do something that was against God. I believe that the serpent did that because of his hatred for God, uh, because he wanted to ruin what God had made, um, and of course uh, to spread his hatred and bitterness and envy of God um, to God's creation as well. But again, this is not the purpose of this lecture here. From the time that the serpent misused rhetoric, from that time forward, fallen men have misused words. And they will. They always will. We do this many ways. By taking God's name in vain, by lying or bearing false witness, by slandering, gossiping, criticizing, and complaining. Even sometimes we misuse rhetoric by holding our tongues when we ought to speak. The psalmist spoke of um, the time when he kept his mouth. He determined that he would say nothing, not even good. Um, and how his bones roared within him while he was musing, the fire burned. A rejection of rhetoric is not the answer to an abuse of rhetoric. Let me be very clear about that. Rhetoric is abused by fallen men. This is part of, uh, we, we abuse everything. A part of our fallen nature is the perversion and corruption of the good things that God has created for us. But abuse of rhetoric is not answered by a rejection of rhetoric. God made us to speak. God called us to speak. God even commands us to speak. We must seek to persuade the lost to turn from their sin, to repent and believe the gospel. We must seek to persuade others to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We must exhort each other and encourage each other in our Christian faith and so on. And all of these things require rhetoric. So if you're thinking that I, as a pastor, believe that when I get up on Sunday and preach a message that I'm using rhetoric, you're exactly right. Now, I believe that preaching is, in fact, the highest and most important form of rhetoric used in our day. Our calling as ambassadors of Jesus Christ requires us to embrace rhetoric. But we must not embrace rhetoric uncritically. Over the centuries, Pagan philosophy has crept in and sought to subvert the right use of words, to misuse rhetoric. We must be cautious and guard against this. Our study of rhetoric will require us to examine some of what heathen philosophers have had to say about it. In order to fully examine the subject, we need to understand that there's a train of thinking that goes into these things. There's a reason why men like Donald T Trump will stand up and, and really abuse rhetoric and so on. I know he's a Republican, I'm a Republican, um, and uh, some may feel that they have to vote for him if he wins the nomination, but nonetheless, um, this is what we see happening. Uh, we need to understand that there's a history behind this. Your book, uh, The Rhetoric Companion, spoke of um, the way that we approach pagan writers, heathen writers, and use two biblical illustrations um, in order to help the Christian understand um, how to use the heathen philosophers, pagan writers, and take what they have said 
and use it as Christians. And the two illustrations that they gave, uh, that the Wilsons gave, are first of all the illustration of plundering Egypt, and the second illustration is of um, finding a beautiful um, captive when you've conquered a nation, one of the beautiful slaves um, in that nation, or one of the conquered people who is taken as a slave and a man falls in love with her and wants to marry her, what he's supposed to do with that. And so I say to you, as we plunder the gold of Egypt, we must make sure that we sift out the trash. We're plundering the gold. We're not raiding their garbage cans. Uh, make sure that you're not raiding the garbage can of the Greek philosophers. If we, um, when we see and encounter beauty and truth um, in Aristotle, Quintilian, and other pagan writers, we must be sure that we carefully examine, um, shave the head, pair the nails, strip away the cultural trappings of paganism that have crept in and in fact are predominant in what these men wrote. We must examine what we're studying in the light of God's word. The Bible teaches us whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are um, true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report. Again, I'm misquoting the, the passage to you, but you know the passage. The Bible says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And that's what we must do when we approach rhetoric. Most of all, we must not depend on anything like wisdom of words, manipulation, sophistry, flattery, um, anything like that, any tricks of persuasion in order to achieve the goal of clear and effective communication. As Christians, we must decisively reject the kind of trickery that often passes off as preaching in our day. The kind of emotional manipulation, the preacher who cries at just the right time in order, not, not because his heart is stirred, but in order to create an effect in you or to make an impre impression on you. That kind of thing we must reject, absolutely. The kind of excellency of speech and wisdom that puts up a gaudy display of rhetoric, but is not backed up by scriptural wisdom or authority. We must take the Apostle Paul's dim view of sophistry, and in exchange for the kind of sophistry that worldly wisdom calls for, we must speak the truth in love, holding substance above style. We must not act as if we're God when we speak, as if everything that we say is true and right based on our own authority. No, our authority comes from God, and if it is an authority coming from the Word of God, thus saith the Lord, then we don't have that kind of authority um, over men. So we should not act as if we're free to speak as, and act as if we're independent of the authority of God in the way that we use rhetoric, because we simply are not. Um, we are all under authority. I, as a pastor, am under authority. I'm under the authority of God. And in a sense, under the authority of my church as well. We must remember that in the way that we use rhetoric and not use it in a humanistic or human, humanly autonomous way, as if we have no guide, no overseer, no ruler over us. We must use rhetoric in submission to God, and that requires us then to use rhetoric for His glory. And by the way, if we're using rhetoric for the glory of God, that means we're not using it for our own glory. We're not using it in order to make an impression on other people. Uh, we're using it in order to proclaim the glory of God. If we would use rhetoric for the glory of God, then that means we must use it well. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. May I remind you of that as you seek to learn this subject of rhetoric, that really what we're doing is teaching you that when you communicate, whether it's spoken or written, when you communicate, you must do it well because you're doing it for God. I hope that you'll remember that. 
Think of those apples of gold and pictures of silver that the Bible speaks of, the word fitly spoken. And that gives us a biblical approach to the subject of rhetoric. Thank you.